Hello and welcome to the B Button. I'm your host, Baron Marth, and I'm joined today with my compadre in arms, Angry Link. Good morning. How do? So, this is our maiden voyage of our new podcast where we talk about the weekly news and views and other items of the gaming industry. So, I think it's important to give you guys a little bit of a background from who we are and where we're from. I like to think of us both as a bit of veteran gamers, really. I would say so, yeah. I we've mean, been, we've been doing it long enough. Yeah, 20 years, give or take, I'd say. Yeah, I was going to say, I probably started when I was about five or six with an old Amstrad C464. Whoa, way back in the day. Yeah, the green screen monster. Oh, man. So this was like tape decks, winding, yeah. rewinding. Oh, yeah. The, the whole 20 minutes, epileptic seizure-inducing screens. Yeah. Uh, I did... Um, I was a sort of a Commodore 64. My brother had one, a little bit of a fighting platform, a Bruce Lee game, and some space es- es- uh, exploration um, drop zone, which was just phenomenal, amazing game. Um, consoles after that? Yeah, well, obviously, friends and, and relatives obviously had consoles. Uh, obviously, we then upgraded to our 60, the Commodore 64 as well. You flash bastard. Well, you know, you got you got to flash it when you've got it, haven't you? <laughs> but no, Phrasing, so, boom. So, obviously, started to go to the NES and then SNESes, and obviously using that one too much, but moved on to the 64 GameCube. I mean, predominantly been a Nintendo gamer for years, and then... Moved on to the Xbox, uh, the original Xbox, then on to Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, and then obviously residing now at the Xbox One. Yeah, not that dissimilar for me, really. Uh, NES, Super Mario, Super Mario 3, lots and lots of um, playing Mega Drive, Streets of Rage, GameCubes, uh, Double Dash, lots of Mario Kart, just uh, you know, a, a world of varied gaming. I think a lot of time was spent on Battlefield Bad Company 2 just like 500 hours plus loads and loads of time on that a little bit first person shooters although I'm always crap at them so yeah I mean just even now I've been through pretty much every console we live on Xbox One I think yeah yeah well there is there is quite a few games though that do require an awful lot of time I mean GTA has taken up far too much of mine at the moment yeah and the problem is it could take up a lot more but anyway we digress a little bit so that's a little bit about who we are and where we come from Uh, to give you a bit of a structure of what the podcasts are going to be about it's a three-part structure starting off with our new section which is our bullet bills big three just talking about the weekly sort of wrap up then moving on to our what's the beef chief section This is where we really just get out our vex and our frustration on the gaming industry. There's always something each week that tends to really eye on my frustration. Stick in your crawled, piss you off. Yeah, Yeah, basically, to put it laymanly, yeah. Yeah, so it gives us an opportunity just to bitch and moan, and you lucky people get to hear it. And then finally we move on to our Uncharted Territory section, which is a bit of a free-form, free-for-all mix-up. Doesn't really fit into any particular section, but something that really warrants talking about, I guess. Yeah, well, it's, I suppose we could probably do something else at the back end there, but I think it's a good chance that we just have a little bit of a free form and it sort of tends to lead off in stray random directions. And I, I think with the structure in the that we've got, I think it's it's something that we need to do because we, we do struggle to stay on point at times. A lot of times, so you're going to have to just kind of rock with us on that one. But yeah, it's, it's just basically an opportunity for us to just go buck wild and, and get it out of our system. So that's pretty much it, folks. We're going to move swiftly on to our Bullet Bills Big 3 section, and here we go. So here we are in our Bullet Bills Big 3 section and uh, we're going to cover some of our news items and our first item or bullet hole of the week is what link? Uh, There's been a leak from EA Brazil, a little video has popped on and surfaced online this week uh, pertaining to some DLC. Right, okay. Uh, Well it's obviously season pass because it's an EA game, Star Wars because it's, you know, billion dollar franchise. Yeah. But... The, this next lot apparently is going to be free. Really? So it's not going to be much of a much. Uh, obviously, a Reddit user, I would quote the name of the Reddit user, but I don't have it to hand, so I'm not Screw going to. Screw that guy. Yeah, that's it. Why give him credit? 
Uh, but basically, it highlights there's going to be daily challenges involved, uh, some private matches, and some special community events. Right, okay. So I'm hoping they're just better than Destiny's. Yeah. Which we'll talk a bit more about later. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, okay, so I, I, I didn't see this coming, really. I knew that Battle of Jakku was going to be free. Um, great, you know, I, I, we all love a bit of free content. I'm one of the suckers who's bought the season pass, as in the nature of my character. Um, so... It, more free content. That's that's come really coming out of left field. Didn't see that coming at all. I am a bit surprised it's free content. Obviously, like you say, the season pass and it is EA. Um, but I think, to be honest, it's one of those that they kind of think they're seeing the, the figures tapering off. Obviously, you've got a lot of big games coming out soon. Obviously, you've got Division Betters due out at the end of this month. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's, again, there's always stuff coming out. And I think they're seeing the numbers drop off a bit. So they're thinking, right, let's push some free stuff out, try and get people back involved again. I mean, it might have been part of the plan, but the cynic in me just sort of looks at its EA and says, no. no got, a, it's, got a bolster those numbers. Yeah, it's basically a quick, uh, quick grab at some... Some uh, populations come back. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's funny because like um, me and uh, another one of my gaming compadres have been sort of waxing that game. Uh, we've both hit level fifty now, and we're kind of wondering what the hell is left to do in that game. Yeah. So yeah, um, good. Well, good to see some new content coming. Frankly. Yeah. Well, uh, obviously, hopefully they they do sort of bring some more bits and bobs like these. I think getting to community involved a bit more and getting some stuff beyond just nude maps and guns and skins yeah it's a good idea I, I mean i'm gonna i'm not one to try and uh, chip into ea's uh, methodology for releasing content but give us some damn fighter squadron galaxy base i want to be up in space near a ship there we go that's my piece i've said it battle of endor we need that yeah exactly exactly that right okay so moving on to our second bullet hole for this week um and it's the mega man helmet so say, it's a bit of a random one yeah i mean Collectibles that I wouldn't have thought would be something I that know. we would uh, I, we would discuss. But. Yeah, I know, I know. I couldn't help it. Um, basically, I'm perusing the news, and um, back in sort of 2015, um, it was announced that the Capcom was releasing this Mega Man helmet, actual full size helmet. Put it on your head. You know the red lights on either ear, all of that jazz. Splits so you can you know close it on on top of your head. Although probably not mine because I have some got a gantry and style head. Um, so yeah, back in 2000. 15 they announced they were going to release this it was in line with um, the sort of you know Mega Man Legacy game that was being released at the time which sort of gave all sort of so was there an anniversary last year? Uh, good question. I know we've had an anniversary very recently, and I think the Legacy Collection was part of that. Yeah. So you also got like the Gold Amiibo and you know, yeah, yeah, you know, all this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so they've had some delays shipping this thing, and finally this week it's going to ship. I think initially it was due to ship sort of a tail end of last year. Um, I think sort of uh, holiday. They had holiday 2015, yeah. which always means December. Then they delayed it to the 20th of this month. 20th of Jan, yeah, uh, which we've had, and it's not shipped, but they. They have now confirmed it's shipping this week. So um, cool. ships from America. It's going to be $150, or is $150. If you want it here in the UK, you're dishing out like another $30 for um, shipment over here. But I think if you th- you know look at some of the other releases, you know the other sort of collectibles which have come out, it's actually not that bad a deal, really. I did see uh, this morning, looking again, perusing, uh, they're releasing a Fallout 4 Power Arm figurine, a uh, Japanese company. I'm glad you said figurine, then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> For two hundred and eighty dollars, or sorry, two hundred and seventy nine dollars. It's fourteen oh. inches. That see, this is the thing. It's just not comparable. You look at what Capcom's offering. Oh, and by the way, go onto their website. You can find it on their sort of shop. But yeah, it's it's not comparable. And actually, the quality of it looks really good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, looking at like you say the price, and I think that's that's for for collectible stuff that you know. Obviously, a lot of Mega Man fans out there. That is pretty good value because yeah. they could be real douches about it and sort of double it, yeah, basically. And I think yeah. people still throw money at them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, although I'm not quite sure what I, feedback I'd get from my girlfriend if she walked back into the flat to find me. I think she would just utter the word helmet. Phrasing boom. Right, okay, so moving on to our third bullet hole for this week. Link, what have you got? Well, we've got a bit of destiny. Uh, because, you know, it's never far from, from the thoughts, to be honest. Uh, obviously, they've released, or Bungie have released this week, their event for Valentine's. So, obviously, this is something that they're going to start doing more and more. Obviously, we had the Halloween event uh, last year. Yeah, that was pretty shit. Yeah, it was absolute dog turds. Um, 
then we had the SLR race in, which is something that people have been asking for literally within the first week of it, it coming out. Yeah, it didn't live um, up to the hype, did it? Not really, no. Not with just the two maps, but obviously with Valentine's Day around the corner, we can look forward to an exciting new mode of 2v2 Crucible matches. 2v2, wow. Um, I know they're also looking at Iron Banner, aren't they, I think? Uh, yeah, Iron Banner, that's going to be again starting, I think, this week, I think from Tuesday. Yeah, uh, more then... more exclusive content for PlayStation. Oh, owners, of course. Yeah, again. I mean it's it's we it's well established that that Sony can kind of or are basically doing what Microsoft were doing last generation and throwing ridiculous amounts of money at people to get exclusive content. Yeah. Uh, I mean the fact that it has paid off because Destiny and the Taken King was still or is still one of the top. Um, downloads from the PS4 store. Damn. Man. So I mean, it's a valid, uh, a valid uh, expense really from Sony. I think. Yeah, we just. I mean, uh, we'll we'll go into this another day, but I I still have um, beef over this. So yeah. we'll, we'll touch this on another. What's the beef? But there was also a couple of other bits. True. There's obviously been various reports released over the last six months um, from the development of the first game of Destiny. Uh, obviously, there's bits where. The reason why it was delayed from 2013 was because they basically decimated the story, chopped the crap out of it, uh, and then obviously released it after they changed it all. But the report obviously did state that Destiny 2 was due this September. Right. Whoa. But that has now been pushed back. There's no clear date from when it's going to be out. Uh, I mean, I'm looking to that as a case of they're just going to do what they do with Warcraft, and it's just going to be a really another big expansion. I'm yeah. thinking that would probably be the case again, but there's been a quite a bit of annoyance from the from the community because this time last year we knew exactly what was coming for Destiny throughout the year. Obviously, we knew we had we was going to get the Dark Below. Mm-hmm. Uh, we knew we was getting the House of Wolves, and then there was going to be a big expansion in September. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's nothing, no clear roadmap from from Bungie this year. But I think the reasoning for that is the fact that. The stuff they had last year was kind of already in place because they'd chopped it out of the main game. Yep. In the in the big um, the mission coal. Yeah, yeah, mission yeah, coal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think that's pretty much really it for it, and I think they're going to face a lot of problems this year trying to keep players interested. Yeah, I mean, are you concerned about sort of the the staff? You know, the content of the staff is it the same staff are doing it now? Or are they sort of yeah. Well, they've got their live team, which is obviously the the group. It's quite a small team that works on the on the content and upcoming content. I mean, it's difficult for them because the design tools that they're using have sort of often been lauded as terrible. Um, it's just really old fashioned. I mean, they're still using the same engines that they were building Halo and Reach and and all of the the, yeah. the Xbox 360 stuff with. And equally, we yeah we have to bear that in mind that this was a game which was cross generational. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's probably been held back a little bit by that. Maybe I mean I hope that you know if they actually do a separate disc release and it's just for next generation, I hope they they push this to the next level. If it's not just next gen. I'm out, quite Ooh. frankly. Uh, it's because by that time the new consoles would have been out for f- four Two, years, three, years. Th- three, four years. Yep. And if you're still rocking a 360, then it's kind of tough to these. Yeah. God um, damn it! Put your hand in your pocket. Yeah. Buy a console now. Cool. Okay, so that's our bullet bills big three section. Uh, we're going to be moving over now to our what's the beef chief. Okay, here we are in our What's the Beef Chief section. So this is basically the section where we carve out large chunks of beef and lay it out on the slab and beat that meat. Beat that meat. Uh, phrasing boom. But anyway, you get the point. We event, we we share a bit of our vex and anger and frustrations in the gaming uh, industry. I don't know, I think it's mainly just griping and getting really shitty and stroppy. What grinds your gears, Lee? Um, but, you know, I, I digress. Uh, basically, it's the the toys to life stuff. Right. Um, obviously, we've seen this week a, a new video coming out from Nintendo and some details about Amiibo support for Twilight Princess HD remake. Uh, obviously, you're going to have certain various characters are going to add and take away from gameplay. So, obviously, for example, the Midna Wolf statue that's coming with the the pack uh, that will unlock a challenge area. Cool. Uh, which is again, it's like um, okay, thingy mabob. Uh, forge, forge, 
Yeah. That kind of stuff. Are you, oh, like, um, no, I think it's more like, um, oh, why have you got me doing this now? I know, I don't know. My brain's just gone blank towards it. It's kind of like the, the sort of the continuous waves. So we're That's talking. It. Yeah. yeah. Waves and waves of characters and enemies that you've got to defeat within a certain amount of time or Duh, health. Yeah, we oh. play games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously, any of the links that you can get, the Toon Link and then the normal character Link, uh, they will fill your quiver of arrows. Yeah, so was it Link is arrows? Yep. Ganondorf's uh, increases extra damage. Extra damage you take. Zelda restores your life. Um, but it's only really the wolf one which actually releases like a, 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 new, a new dungeon. Area. Well, not yeah. dungeon, but a, it was, what do they call it? The a challenge arena. Shadows. Ca- Cave of Shadows. That's it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I mean, quite a nice idea, I guess. That's probably using it a little bit yeah. better than what we've seen in the past for Amiibo. Yeah, because, I mean, the. The, the sort of previously other than costumes and bits and bobs and maybe the odd stage on Smash Brothers, we've not really seen a great deal for, for gameplay uses that it was talked up to sort of what the two, three years ago when Iwata announced them at E three or on the direct. So obviously it's starting to bring amiibos actually some some value to the, the concept. But I still think this Toys to Life thing is a complete rip off. I mean, if we start from the pioneers which was uh, Activision, or as we commonly known here at the uh, at the B button, is Cash Division. Um, obviously, it's just again, excuse my language here, guys, but it's just shite. Uh, I mean, they lock stuff away behind certain character types. I mean, the fact that they're bringing out new different ones, a new system every year. It's like what was it? We had the original ones, which was just plain plastic, and then you had the giant ones. Then you had the ones that you could split up and put different parts on the top and the bottom and now we've got the racing series one which they've basically got Nintendo involved with the Bowser, uh, Bowser and Donkey Kong yeah they did like some bespoke Bowser uh, one and like a Donkey Kong Turbo yeah it's yeah, ridiculous yeah. Uh, obviously Disney Infinity 3.0 I mean the fact of the, the catalogue of characters that Disney have got I mean literally they can go for 10 years and still keep releasing characters and people will still buy them but that one's a bit better because it actually adds content that you can use to build extra stuff and build extra levels with. I mean, it's still shite, don't get me wrong. So, I mean, so really the difference at the moment, and once again, I haven't had a great deal of experience playing either of them or any experience, but Skylanders kind of presents you with what you could be playing and go out and buy the figurine to play it. Yeah. And the flip on Infinity where it's like, buy this figurine and we'll add some content to your game. Yeah, we'll add extra extra um, stuff to put into the stages you can build because obviously it is, a, it is a great sandbox game, don't get me wrong. It's a great kid uh, game you can sit down with your kids and you can make a little level yourself between you and you can bring in your favourite characters if you want to stump up the fucking cash. Yeah, it sounds like it's, you're still choosing which like the lesser of two evils on that, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, again... Like the amiibo, uh, it's starting to get there, but I still think it's it's very much a, a case of all oh, right. We like Nintendo were kind of desperate for money re- revenue. Um, yeah. Obviously, the Wii U's not taken off like it should. Uh, so obviously, they needed to come up with a plan to encourage people to buy a a Wii U and b amiibos. Yeah. So they're starting to get it right, but still, it's a rip off for me. So for me, with amiibos, I think I mean they they kind of they kind of get it right, and then they kind of get it wrong. So. Nintendo have got some really strong IPs and they do very good at marketing the shit out of them uh, to make sure that you buy... Well, I think every- it's milking the shit out of them yeah. and their marketing's always been terrible. Yeah, but I mean, either which way, they're good at sort of making sure that you're buying different guises of the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Now, with the Amiibos, um, I think the one thing they have got right is that they're they're almost cross-game. So you, you can have an Amiibo sat on your shelf, you could have bought it day one, and as you buy another game, you find out, hold it, wait, this thing supports that and you yeah. get some extra content out of what you've already bought. I think that is in itself, yeah. It's because it's um, it's system level, it's a lot more varied and uh, there's a lot more opportunity to do some interesting things with it as opposed to Disney Infinity, which is you need this little power portal piece piece of plastic. Yeah. And the same with Skylanders. Oh, it lights up and everything. whoop de shit um, Yeah, I think there is a lot of opportunity. I think uh, the, the biggest sort of rip-off one for me is the Lego one. Um, I mean, I've got a lot of love for Lego. I mean, I love the games. The Telltale games are brilliant. I mean, but they're a fine example of flogging a dead horse 
basically. It's the same game over and over again, just different reskins. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reskinning going on there. And let's be honest, Lego is stupidly overpriced as a toy in itself. Yeah. Um, there is a Millennium Falcon sat behind us, which cost me far too much money to... To admit to how much you wanted to, to spend yeah, on it. To spend a, a weekend know, putting plastic blocks I'd love, I'd love to buy the Death Star, but no, seriously, that's that's like a, that's a weekend break away. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. But, I mean... The one possibly good side of the Lego thing is you actually get a toy out of it. Well, you've got Lego. Yeah, that can you can then go if you bought the say Lego's Portal pack, you could then put see what Lego shell looks like in the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, it's it works as Lego. Yeah, that in it that's the only saving grace for for Lego Dimensions for me. Yeah. Lego also, I mean, I guess and this is something that we we've sort of talked about previously is that. Their licensing is pretty strong in the fact oh. that they get things such... I mean, what have we got? We've got Simpsons in there. We've got Portal, Scooby-Doo. I mean, they've Doctor got... Who. Doctor Who. That's a big, big one. That that will sell the bucket loads. I mean, they've got some pretty strong licenses. I mean, look there. at... Again, to go off topic a bit, but look at the Lego movie. Some of the, the characters that they had in that film, and they're just reeling them off. And... Batman, D, you know, getting DC in you've, there. You've got the the DC range. You've got the Marvel range. You've got like uh, a lot of Universal stuff properties. I mean, the the sky's the limit for them. Yeah, and I think that 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 in itself is a lot more valuable. I mean, I think they're the only ones that come close to Disney in terms of of the licensing yeah. and the the pulling power that they've got with those. Because I mean, not being horrible, but if you're playing like Lego Dimensions and they bring out a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one. Are you not going to buy it? Of course you are. Yeah, it's dangerous. <laughs> dangerous, man. I need Raphael. Um, but yeah, so I guess one of the questions I kind of put to it is, uh, is this, I mean, you walk into a, any sort of game shop now and uh, at well, least what? a third of it now has become these plastic Toys figurines. to life. Yeah. yeah. It, is this really the way it's going to go? Do we need it to go this way? I mean, are, are we getting, are, you know, are they adding value, as you, you know, the question you posed at the beginning, or are they just cashing in? Because if, for me, if we were getting a toy, and not that I spend a great deal of time, I do spend maybe no more than four or five hours a day playing with my toys, but generally not a great deal of time playing with toys, but if you were getting something which is playable with, and also it adds content to the video game. I mean, you said to me earlier on, one of the most exciting concepts of this was to take this little plastic toy, yeah. and it was a toy, put it onto something, and it comes to life in your game. That's quite an exciting idea. I, I mean, yeah, when it first came out, uh, Skylanders, I mean, it was sold brilliantly, because let's not kid ourselves, when we were little kids, who wouldn't have wanted, and especially when Toy Story came out, the, the fiction of that, like your toys being alive... And, yeah, brilliant. I love the idea of that Small Soldiers was another one that touched on that kind of theme, wasn't it? Yeah, but, I mean, um, like you said, if I, back in the day, if I could have taken my Transformer or my Mask character and just... It dropped it up, into the TV. He-Man. Yeah, and you can you can control this moving, animated character. Yeah. Again, it's, I, could, I can understand why my nephew goes absolutely batshit for it. Yeah. Because that would have blown my mind as a kid. <laughs> yeah, right. Even now, like, like, I'm talking about, like, the Lego stuff. That blows my mind. I'm, I'm just being stubborn and reasonable and I think sensible yeah. <laughs> and not buying Lego Dimensions. Because I'm, it, it literally, it takes all of my power not to buy into it and get suckered into it. Let's be honest, what's the start pack's like 80 quid or something? Isn't yeah, it? the start pack's 80 quid. The One of the websites did a roundup of like to, like to buy the new Skylanders sets and get all of the toys, to buy the Disney Infinity set to get all of the toys, and then to buy the Lego set and to get all of the toys. They sort of worked out how much each one was. Yep. The Lego one clearly won in terms of it was the most. It was like 280 quid to buy, and there was like four, four packs that <gasps> come out with at the start. I mean, it's ridiculous, or uh, five or six. I obviously I haven't got the actual figures down, but I remember I clearly remember it was closer to three hundred pounds than it was further away. I mean, th- uh, let's be honest. That's I mean, this is probably where the that's, beef comes in here. So, like, because this is where we end up in a situation where parents are getting um, antagonised by their children because they they want that next pack, and to invest that sort of money into one game is crazy. I mean, I can't really criticise um, 
because I, I would hate to think how much I spent on Rock Band back in the day. But, <laughs> but it was disposable income. I mean, it was... Your money? It was my money that I'd gone out and earned. And to be honest, let's, let's, let's not be around the bush. I was at that age that, yeah, I could have gone down the pub and pissed it all against the wall. Yep. Um, so I put it into something that I could get repeated value from it and I got a lot of enjoyment and value from it so I didn't see that as a as a massive expense or... similar to porn mags really well I was going to say just similar to buying a track on iTunes right okay um, it's something that you may only listen to once or twice or play once or twice but at least you've enjoyed it and it's only a small amount of money yeah I mean obviously it's just lots and lots of small amounts of money which probably equated to again a short break away in uh, various European cities around the Around Europe, obviously. I, I hate to think how much money I spanked on GTA. <laughs> Just yeah. crazy amounts. But, you know, either which way, like you said, there is some repetitive value to that, and that's yeah. the important thing. But it's your money, and you're not antagonising someone and kicking off and screaming, and someone's not buying it for you just to shut you up yeah. and to keep you quiet. Yeah. I mean, this is the problem. It's the way that it's marketed, and... Like, obviously, let's not kid ourselves. These companies are out to make money. They're nobody's friend but their shareholders. Mm-hmm. Um, so they want to get the best value that they can for their shareholders they're legally obliged to do. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate that it's in their, their remit. But it's still a cheeky, cheeky bastard move. Yeah, I me. mean, uh, as always, it comes down to price point with these things. You know, if you... Lego is ridiculous in itself. Yeah. You then... So, if you can add some value to that... I mean, I think, out of all enough. of them, um, the, the Lego one, for me, is the least... the, or the smallest offender. Yeah. Because even if you don't have a computer, you can still take that weight and enjoy it with every other bit of Lego that you, have, that you own. Yeah. So that... It, it slightly sort of alleviates that... I'm what's what's that terrible pinching I'm feeling? Yeah. Oh, that's that's me being reamed. Yeah, I mean the the, the other thing is you look at Amiibo. Um, you know, in the recent Twilight um, yeah. Princess um, that... video that they released, they actually make a specific statement. This is going to be support. This Amiibo, this Wolf, um, Zelda, and um, Midna is actually going to be supported in the new Zelda, yeah. which is coming out. So, like you say, that that yeah console level work actually I think works that that in itself is better so yeah. you're not having to every year buy the new portal yeah. which won't support it will support the old ones but your old portal won't support the new ones yeah, and yeah. all that bollocks yeah okay so i mean in the grand scheme of things um wrapping up on this note w- where are we it's overpriced for me um but again i'm a miserly stingy old git so i kind of expect that most things are probably overpriced for me anyway uh, I'm turning into me dad. <laughs> oh. um, but I think the way that content is locked away in some of these games is ridiculous. Uh, because let's, let's not... We're, like, if we're going to be frank, you are bending people over and holding them to ransom. Yeah. Because we know what kids can be like. They can be obnoxious little shits that have got no concept of worth or money or value or earning something. All they know is they want it and they need it. So my, my girlfriend explains me the same way. Hmm. But yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. In in the grand scheme of things, um, it is it's dangerous, and we are putting parents in difficult positions here. Yeah. Different thing if you've got your own expendable income, but equally, you probably ask yourself, Wait a minute, what what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whoa, whoa. What else can you be spending that money on? So in the grand scheme of things, for me, I'm gonna have to say, uh, it's got to become a little bit smarter, a little bit more cost effective. I'd like to see actual full DLC levels available on yeah, games you, that I want to play for things yeah. such as Amiibos and stuff. If you like. link it if you link it with stuff that adds value and brings content, gravy. I think that that in itself, like you say, yeah. with the with the Midna one, which will be like obviously sixty dollars pack in America. So I'd imagine, because it's a HD remaster, they're probably charging like $50 for the game. It's a little bit less than, yeah. than what it would normally be. But at least that adds something new to the game. And again, it would work on other games mm. uh, in the future. And you don't have to buy a crappy portal. You've already bought that. You bought the Wii U. Yeah, That's yeah. got it all involved. So, yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, I just, for me, it's like, you know, we already, we're already buying DLC We've already got, you know, we're already putting our hands in our pockets for that £15 or £10 or whatever it is. So if I've got an opportunity to get a little figurine or collectible which comes with that, great. 
but let's not get it the wrong way around where you buy a figurine and guess what instead of wearing a black outfit you're now wearing a blue one yeah some rudimentary crappy yeah, yeah I think that put it, puts it as well as I could have really crappy cool right on that note we're going to wrap up our what's a beef chief I feel like we've vetted there I feel like we've yeah. got a little bit of vex it's over that I'm going to be in a really crappy mood all day now because I'm just <laughs> pissed off cool so let's wrap this bad boy up and we'll be back in a bit with our uncharted territory Okay, so here we are in our Uncharted Territory section. So this is a section where we like to just basically explore some random thoughts about gaming. It doesn't really fit into any particular part of the podcast, so it's a bit of a free-for-all, really. And like most explorers, we just managed to stumble upon something good. Yeah, and try and put our names to it. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what have we got this week, Link? Uh, well, obviously, with the um, news that Oculus and VR is now, this is the year of VR that we're constantly being told, I had a thought. Has game design reached its zenith as to the gameplay mechanics and delivery? Mm, interesting. So there are certain genres which are more, uh, shall we say, prone to not being able to be developed, in my opinion. Well, they like, haven't changed really since the Atari days. Yeah, I mean, so for me personally, I, straight away I think about the fighting genre. Um, we look at the, the classics, Mortal Kombat, we look at Street Fighter. Um, the you know, brilliant, brilliant games, and yes, they have been developed um, both graphically and mechanically, but only in marginal ways. So, you know, in Street Fighter, we've once they got to sort of combos, special moves, super moves, um, more than one character tagging in, tagging mm. out, it kind of it kind of stopped there. And yes, you've got your combo breakers and things such as Killer Instinct and, and your counters and stuff, but I don't really see the genre getting sort of reimagined or or developed massively. No. I think, I mean, if you if we were to sort of start from, from where, like, to start from day zero, mm-hmm. and you had your the sort of your things like Yi Kung Fu, the old classic Konami ones, your, yep. your Kung Fu, the, the old scroll and beat em up, um, IK, mm-hmm. where... You see the differences between the the generation between that and say Street Fighter Two, where obviously the the combo um, or a combination of hits that would stop the the opponent from moving or being able to do anything, obviously was obviously designed by accident. Um, but yeah, you, you can see you can see some clear sort of progression and here's here's a milestone and how it's changed and what has changed. Um, but like you say, over the last say what twenty years. There's not really been a, a great deal of of new um, inputs or new ways to deliver the mechanics. There's not really been... I think the last game that changed the fighting genre was probably Tekken or Dead or Alive, something like that, yeah. where you've got your left and right uh, kick and punch. Yeah, so, I mean, if it, the real sort of, like, turning point, I guess, was really, as you mentioned previously, we, said, we looked at 3D. Mm. So there was, like, Battle Arena to Shindon on the PlayStation. Yeah. Obviously, um, Soul Blade. Oh, Soul Blade. Um, you know, we had things such as Soul Blade, Soul Calibur, where they brought in a counter mechanic, so you you had a, a couple of strikes, horizontal, vertical kick, and then you've got your block button. You, well, which, you've got specific <coughs> counters to counter specific moves. Yeah, yeah, so move sets. high and low counter and you know, mm. so those sorts of things came in, and yeah, we had things. That, I mean, if, if we go back to the sort of the original sort of like combo sort of coming into it, and we did a little bit of research on this beforehand, um, it was a game called Renegade back in uh, 1986, and then later on, uh, sort of a year later, we also had Double Dragon. This is where sort of like combos came into it, and that you well, know, multiple hits, it wasn't just one hit dead, yeah, exactly. So you, you know, do a AAB or ABB yeah. or something like that, um, but. You know, we haven't seen massive movements other than graphical delivery no. in more recent years. And I'm starting to think, uh, have we hit a peak where we can't actually do anything else now with the fighting genre? I think this is where, uh, well, I suppose the last one that was tried was motion control, really, wasn't it? Obviously, you had the Wii, um, obviously started it a bit. Obviously, you've always had little bits and bobs in the arcade, but I think if you're going to talk about mechanics that are fit and settled, then you, you have to talk about the home console market and the computer market. Um, obviously, we saw with Kinect as well that there was obviously some of the really dire um, games that, because 
that the thing was you you had to perform a specific action, and unless you'd trained and actually like like you would say in a, a kung fu or boxing or any sort of combat sport where it's it's muscle memory and you you train with repetition, so you know to and you punch the same way every time. It was a real struggle for the for the connect to keep up to know what you were trying to do. Yeah, if you've got some like real fan bastard gamer who hasn't got out of like his, most most gamers, yeah, who hasn't got out of their chair for absolutely years, and then you ask them to spend like twenty minutes jumping around in their living room. Yeah, it's great for exercise, but realistically, most people just haven't got the energy or inclination to do no, that. No, they don't want it. I mean, how many people playing the Wii develop like like Wii tennis? Like, all oh, right, yeah, you get up and you jump around and you like doing backhands, and then you discover no, you can still do exactly the same. Just by sitting down, sitting in your chair, sitting in your chair, just waving the, the wand, just the, the slightest Freezing. flicks of the wrist, again, boom. boom. <laughs> um, and again, like the boxing, and yeah, you, yeah, you could sit there and you could throw punches, or you could just hold them like drumsticks and just flick it. Yeah. So you could like bam, 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 and then the up flick for the uppercuts and the and yeah, I mean, it's always been a way. I think that's the thing with gamers. We always find the hacks and the and the shortest sort of least part or path of least resistance yeah. or effort. Do you find that um, that's? I mean, once again, I, I'm focusing. I'm focusing a lot on the fighting genre here. Maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm just thinking about specifically. Is it because? We only want what we want. So, for example, we've we've had we, Street Fighter for years. We've had competitions. And we've got all these esports based around it. People are used to playing in a particular way. Um, we look at sort of say back in the PlayStation days, we had Bushido Blade come out, which was a completely different fighting dynamic where you could kill somebody with a single hit, or if you struck their arm, it actually stopped them from yeah. being able to act in particular yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You're a uh, move set was then restricted because you you weren't using your right arm let's say yeah so your your strikes would then become weaker no. and like you say it would ha- have detrimental effects on the on the gameplay yeah and i guess you could argue that maybe people just didn't really want that bushido blade was really uh, it wasn't well received i no, think it was it, quite, quite critically well received wasn't it but just in terms of sales it didn't do, it just didn't, didn't do pick up well. any sort of traction and you know I, I wonder if it's because people just don't want it or because we've kind of hit the bottom of the well um yeah i think it's one of those isn't it because like like with films like the the most critically acclaimed films and that are wonderful for so many various reasons don't sell well or like they don't make a lot of money at the cinema yeah because they're not uh, a great uh, venue or a great vessel for escapism and yeah. I think again we all play games to for that escapism for like I'm never going to be a fighter pilot but I can put on a game and feel a little bit like a fighter pilot for just a, a few moments mm-hmm. rock bands a prime example. I'm never going to have the time, the effort, the money, or the energy now to become a rock drummer. But for those three minutes, I'm a fucking god. Yeah, damn right. I am Keithy Moon, absolutely wailing on those drums, remembering that I've driven my Rolls Royce into a swimming pool and thrown three TVs out of the of the balcony. Neil Peart stands alone. He does. He does. Um, so uh, yeah, but uh, you know, equally, I guess the other question is, is that if you take certain games and let's take, I know, say GTA. Do you want to run out of fuel? Do you want to have to go fill up the car? I, I was um, I was chatting to someone uh, to a red eye uh, online about this the other day, and I mean, I remember Mafia. They had like like if you run red lights, the cops would try and stop you, uh, and you would get rumbled for for running red lights. And they had fuel in their cars, and I mean, yes and no. I mean, it's one of those, isn't it? You don't play GTA for for the ultra realism. Yeah. You play GTA because it's ridiculous, because it's it's silly at times, and it's because it's got those stupid adverts. But then likewise, you go and play a game like Mafia, and you like that because there's that sort of edge of realism to it, and that's because it's more lifelike, and it's less satirical, and it's more cynical. But, do, you know, you, do you really want to get pulled over by a cop for speeding? I don't think you do, really. Um, it depends on the context of the game. A game like GTA it ruins it. Yeah, because you're it's a lot more of a fun sandbox whereas a game like Mafia I think it adds value because you are a mafioso or you're an, an underling in a mafia mob. Yeah. You you've kind of like you say crime you're there for crime and to become part of this organization and I think it kind of lends itself to it a bit better. So what about um, different genres? Like, for example, we look at sports. Um, if we look at, say, the Madden series or you know American football. Oh god, yeah. You like to start with the old like um, the old arcade ones where it was one or maybe two buttons and a joystick. <clears throat> and you see, I mean, 
the gameplay itself has never really changed because again it's a game as a sport that doesn't change rules get altered slightly but it's still the same like with um, soccer games um, American football games rugby games cricket games those rules are still implicitly the same mm. other than the few variations and the control mechanisms for those games I, I mean you look at say something like Tiger Woods they keep trying to chuck in different variations of games or whatever but essentially it all comes back down to well I think the last one for that was the, the analogue stick introduction that's right it? yeah I mean but beyond that I, I know people that have been playing like you say games for sort of the word dot uh, mm. from the day dot um, and they still like like the old press A to start the backswing, hit A to stop the backswing, and then obviously wait for it to go through the front swing, and then hit A to hit it on that sweet spot. Yeah. I mean, even, like, uh, I can't remember which Tiger Woods it was, but it actually had the option to do both control schemes. That's right, yeah. I mean, and they try other things, so they put in sort of, like, different mechanics for, like, you know, like, view your part, you mm. know, and uh, use your special ability to make yeah, your, con- your they, precision better or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's always little additions and tweaks, but I think fundamentally with sports games, the only thing that changes um, is the control schemes. I mean, um, we can look like, at certain games, like, for example, if you take, like, in skateboarding games, and the example that you gave earlier on was uh, if you take something like Tony Hawk's. Tony Hawk's was you hold down the button, release to jump, you know, you press a square button to do a grind. Slam as many buttons as you can to get as much score out of it as you can. Up down on the D-pad to get your manual going or whatever. Mm. But what they did with something like Skate, where they completely redesigned the control mechanisms of, of a skating game, and they put all the controls on the analogs, where you did sort of a, a fireball manoeuvre to yeah. sort of pop a certain well, trick. Um, we was actually playing that the other day around, uh, uh, around Panasonic's, uh, obviously because he'd picked up Skate 2 for the, for the Xbox 360, and he's finally downloaded it. And then he saw the control scheme, and he's like, basically it's like playing Street Fighter on a skateboard. Yep. He's like, yeah, yeah, it's totally that, mate. It really is. Because, yeah, you've got your... You back forward, blah, 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 quarter rotations and all of this stuff. Um, I mean, I think the thing is, sort of, controllers really haven't changed for the last, what, 15 years. Since, like, uh, analog sticks and the 64 come out with analog sticks, and then obviously you had PlayStation counted it with the DualShock 2. I don't think the PlayStation controller has changed since the PlayStation 1, has it? Uh, since I mean, DualShock come out. Yeah. Yeah, that it's, not, it's not changed. Obviously, they tried to change it for the PlayStation 3 because obviously they hadn't licensed it, because they don't actually own that design, I don't think. They might do now, but I do remember at the time that they were going with the original boomerang look thing, which everyone absolutely hated, even though it's probably a nicer controller to hold. Um, but, yeah, they, they absolutely flipped, didn't they? They flipped their lids. Yeah, yeah, and so, change. I mean, so I don't know how we can... Um, how the gaming industry has the ability to change these things especially you know and I think we start to see this in things such as FPS's now with the likes of Call of Duty Call of Duty's stuck it can't change too far away from no, no, what that's, that is as a control scheme is has been the same since time immoral really but it's basically I can't I can't think of I mean admittedly I didn't play the um, sort of PS2 era ones like one to three. I mean, I I got in at, at Call of Duty four, obviously Modern Warfare one. Um, I've not seen the control scheme change since that, and that was nine, ten, eleven, twelve years ago now. I mean, what, in Black Ops three now, you've got press L, B, and R, B at once to use your special ability. But these are this is sort of additional items. This is gravy on top of what They're you've already got. Basically, having to having to to use what they or get out as much as they can out of what they've got. Yeah, so there was a game on the PlayStation 3, uh, specifically it's a Killzone game, which worked really well with the motion controls that they had. They mm. actually brought out a... Um, a they brought out the peripheral, bit, yeah, the, the gun, wasn't it? You that's right. put the move controller in, and that I thought was brilliant. Yeah, so you know, you had your motion control on the top, you had at the back sort of the analogue uh, sort of supporting peripheral which came, uh, that you bought, could buy separately, and you ended up with like this SMG style control mechanism, yeah. which you could reload by doing either a shotgun manoeuvre or tapping the button where there was a button on, uh, the, on the, the clip. clip yeah. um, and all these things, and I really loved that, and I thought this is great, I really hope something happens and people embrace this and they do it and it's something different, and it almost took me to like that sort of Time Crisis, House of the yeah. Dead sort of like feel? Well I think this is where obviously the, the initial point with VR because obviously you, you yes you can use a traditional controller with VR but it's something as a as a, a system 
or as a, a delivery system, it's something that lends itself to motion control so much better. Because essentially, you don't even need to see, like with the Oculus Touch controls, it literally it looked really strange. I mean, it looks like just two little bits of plastic with a couple of buttons on them. But obviously, because your your eyes and your ears and everything else is covered, that controller then becomes whatever you see in the game. So obviously you're immersed into it, and if it's, like you say, if it's a, a, an assault rifle, or a pair of swords, or a sword and shield, or just a pair of hands, I mean, I think it's, that is now, is you're going to see some really, really interesting uh, mechanics evolve from the, the design problems that, that companies face. I mean, Crytek, I saw a really good demo um, that they did uh, a couple of conventions ago which has actually become a game. And basically, he, this guy was climbing up this rock face, this cliff, and obviously you're having to sort of release the buttons to grab, uh, to let go, and then as you reach up, you press them again to grab. And like you say, you see the hands moving up, and there's sort of like a real one-to-one -one reaction as opposed to, uh, say, something like on a controller. Yes, you've got the same kind of things with the R or the triggers, but yeah, you you're still, talking like Uncharted, Lara yeah, Croft, those sorts of things. Where it just doesn't, it, not the same. Yeah. No, it doesn't. There's no, not immersion as such, but there's no sort of one-to-one -one feedback with it. Like yeah. whereas if a VR headset, you're looking at the hands that, and you you know you're raising your hand up. You can feel it in in real life. You're raising your hand up to that point and grabbing. Yeah, you're gripping, and yes, obviously there's no tactile feedback because of you know you're gripping the air as opposed to a big lump of rock but I think I think VR and especially like PlayStation the move controller is going to come back in a big way yeah so VR um, is potentially the saving grace for these things Although, I think it's this is the next the next progression of sort of game mechanics and, and delivery of controls yeah but how that will work in, in sort of certain genres such as you know I can see it with golf games I can't see it Sport. with fighting games yeah yeah I, I think um, like say fighting games it's one of those that if you want, uh, a, say, a boxing simulator, then, yeah, it works. But something like Street Fighter, no, it's it's a fight stick all the way. Yeah, and, you know, uh, so 16%, the uh, percentage I saw on, online earlier on, 16% of developers right now are working on VR games, which means this is coming big, you know, this is, this yeah, is when you, not... When you think of the amount of studios that are out there... Yeah, That's, this is not uh, going to be a small sort of... Um, this is not going to fall quietly into the night, this one. This is going to impact our you know, our industry well, notably. I think the technologies involved have come to come down to such a price point now that, that it is affordable, whilst not necessarily for everyone at the moment. It's not, it's not the 1% of people anymore. It's more like 30 or 40% of people will probably be able to afford it quite happily and, and invest in it. Um, I mean, you're looking at the price that that the Oculus Rift that was what four hundred ninety nine dot um, pounds. I mean, not being horrible, that's that's a, a half decent telly. I mean, for for an experience that potentially could be game changing and amazing, that's not a lot of money to spend. No. I mean, you could you could quite easily go out for a weekend and spend that. Mm. I I personally would like to see things now get to a point where we start re-evaluating with this new control method which is out there uh, or which is coming to us now re-evaluating actually really what do we want to do with the gaming genres that we all know and love you mm. know and, and I think we're always going to want what we have experienced previously but equally we're going to want to see something I want to see something different we want to uh, I mean if you if you go for the same things over and over again I mean look at the COD series I mean Pretty much most gamers, other than the most hardcore fans, uh, are quite accepting of the fact that COD's got a bit stagnant now. I mean, it's like, all through the last generation, it's like, yep, yeah, you owned it. All like the 360 and the PS3 generation, yeah, you completely owned it. But now you're seeing people coming into the into this, uh, scene, and they're doing little things differently. I mean, I remember Brink when it came out, and I loved that game, because I loved that free-running mechanic. I mean, Mirror's Edge was another one I absolutely adored, because... It took the first person genre and just flipped on its head. It's like, no, no, this isn't about shooting. It's not. It's not a first person shooter. It's just a first person simulation as such. Um, and like Brink with the free running involved with the shooting, I love that. And that to me was I enjoyed that more than I have any other COD. Yeah. Because it did. It dared to be different. 
Yeah, and, and that's the important thing is, is for people to push for that difference. And I think this is the exciting part, though, is now you've got a new opportunity for different games. I was saying to you that Crotech one, that's actually been developed into a full blown game. Yeah, and, uh, you know, me personally, I'd like, actually like to see um, people taking a bit more risks and a bit more ch- uh, you know, chances with these sorts of things. I think it, it could potentially find ourselves in a position where we end up getting, dare I say, it, the, the kind of connect. The last connect generation of gamings, where you get sort of this. Um, Basically, it's a really poor, filler, poor game or a dancing simulator. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's hope we don't see that. Anyway, so you know, hopefully, what we're going to see in the future is things getting a little bit better and a little bit sharper with what they do with the genres. We'll never know. We're going to find out. Okay, so uh, with that, that's our that's our time to round up and wrap up. Uh, thank you for joining us this week. Um, it's uh, our first one, so it may be a little bit rough around the edges but hopefully we'll get there as we keep cracking on week by week. Uh, thanks for listening, for those who've joined us. So from Angry Link, it's... Hasta luego. And from me, I'm putting an egg in my shoe. I'm going to beat it. Bye for now.